Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we are blessed to have the opportunity to interview Antonio Rafael. Antonio is an indigenous writer, public speaker, entrepreneur, radical economist, educator, artist, beekeeper, and farmer from Southwest Detroit. Much of his work has been dedicated to lecturing, writing, and acting in opposition to the neoliberal assault on Detroit and water. His media interviews, viral street art, blogs, and articles have been featured across movies, magazines, and other kinds of media. And in 2015, Antonio was actually arrested for painting hashtag free the water on a water tower in the midst of the Flint water crisis and Detroit shutoff crisis. Now, beyond just resisting the abuse of public goods, he seeks to use agroecological and permaculture principles to help reshape the broader urban ecology. And Antonio's work is always deeply rooted in the community. He's co-founded Black to the Land, a coalition organization of black families that organizes camping and hiking trips throughout Michigan. And he works with the National Wildlife Federation, cultivating a love for nature and the environment among Detroit high school students. He and three other beekeepers founded the Southwest Detroit Cooperative in 2016. And Antonio works with indigenous communities across the Great Lakes, locally in Jaga Zibise, which we know as Detroit. He organized with the Detroit Indigenous Community to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. He's also done work in uniting the BIPOC community towards common goals, organizing an annual decolonial solidarity feast, bringing together indigenous and African leaders from the region. I find Antonio an extremely potent activist who has a unique gift for connecting social movements with struggles for land reclamation and intersectional environmental justice in a way that creates change across the emotional, social, political, and economic spectrum. Antonio, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yo, it's a major honor. I'm excited to be here. Well, I got to say the honor is all mine. I followed your work for a long time. And I think you're one of those people who puts a lot of the principles and knowledge that I talk about on this podcast into action in communities and environments that probably need it most or can get the most benefit from it. So it's always been hugely inspiring. And we've obviously got a ton to talk about, you know, between your relationship with Back to the Land practices, your activism, groups you help organize. There's a ton to get into. Uh, but just before we dive in, I was really curious to hear the story of kind of how you got to where you are today. And obviously it's a life story that could be many podcasts in itself, but maybe just some of like the synchronistic moments, the major yeah. influences that pushed you to develop a relationship with nature and start working with the land. So I, I grew up in Southwest Detroit, which is like the kind of like the Latino community, but I'm on the border of Dearborn, which is the highest concentration of Arabs outside the Middle East. Uh, it's also like near West Detroit. So it's like incredibly diverse immigrant neighborhood. A lot of my neighbors are Yemeni. It's like a lifelong journey of like waking up to the world, you know, uh, and certainly it's grounded deeply in the segregation uh, and anti-blackness that you see in Detroit that I think mm. it's it's sharply refined in Detroit. But there are evidences of similar structures and systems all over the country in metropolitan areas in particular. But I, I went to... Catholic school, K through 12, and Catholic schools were being pushed out commensurate with the public school system in Detroit and a lot of urban communities. And again, as you mentioned, the concept of neoliberalism, it, it really reflects my journey. Uh, mm -hmm. As they introduced policies that allowed for for-profit charter schools and allowed for students to be equated to dollar signs, families who could afford to send their kids to private schools began sending their kids to suburban schools. So I started off in my local community. I went to, you know, third grade, that school closed. I went through eighth grade, another school in Detroit, that school closed. In high school, I went to this school called Detroit Catholic Central, which is kind of like an all guys private Catholic elite high school. And that cognitive dissonance of going further and further away from the hood and deeper and deeper into the white picket fence, like, you know, American dream suburbs. I came to just like see the difference between the communities. And it was something I just grew up curious about not clear of why <clears throat> my community doesn't deserve good education you know clean communities like lack of pollution 
access to nature. All of these things were just things I noticed were missing in my community, but present in others. So then I got to college. Uh, There's a number of experiences that really were turning me on to the world there. But one in specific was traveling to Latin America. I did a, a class called Poverty, Health and Human Rights in El Salvador. Uh, and we met with FMLN communities, like leftist communities, who had been fighting a U.S.-sponsored revolt in that country, U.S.-sponsored counterinsurgency against the leftist government that had been democratically elected. Uh, and learning about that struggle was just so so shocking and so eye-opening to me. And then, you know, I continued on. I actually spent some time with the Zapatistas as well. My professor was uh, writing about them, so I had a chance to connect with indigenous revolutionaries down in Mexico, in southern Mexico and just learn about their struggle and learn about their movement. While I was in college in 2009, I got a call from my mom on the phone. She said, come home quick. The house is on fire. So I drove, uh, I borrowed a car from a friend. Me and my brother got in our cars and we drove to Detroit back from college in Ypsilanti. It was about like 30 minutes west of here outside of Ann Arbor. And I came home and the front window of our house was smoldering. uh, And there were men throwing all of our stuff into a dumpster next to the house. So it turns out that the day that my parents' house was being taken by the banks was the same day there was a a random electrical fire, which caused a couple rooms to burn. I remember digging up yearbooks and family albums out of the trash and just like wondering what this was about and why this was happening. And this is 2009. When I went back to college, I really just switched my major to economics and I really began studying uh, economic history and uh, economic trends. And I came to understand that a lot of predatory lending was happening, particularly in black and brown communities, but all over the country. And that really disproportionately impacted Detroit, which is the blackest major city in the entire country. So when I got back to Detroit in 2012, I got a fellowship kind of like doing it was like a democracy fellowship, getting out the word to vote. And at the same time, the governor had taken away governance in all a lot of the black cities, literally 50 percent of Michigan's black population lost its democracy for a couple of years. And that was a result of financial emergency, which was a direct result of the same crisis that my family underwent. I came to learn that 250,000 other Detroiters in a city of 700,000 lost their homes in, a short, in that short 10 years following the 2008 financial crisis. And this kind of like awareness of the financial improprieties and the inequality of the, this, the area. I mean, there is a community just north of Detroit where the average income is $386,000 a year. The average income of the entire city of Detroit is $26,000 a year. Wow. So for me, it was just a, a big wake-up call. And the, in the, the nonprofit I was organizing for wasn't focused on this. I'm sitting here trying to motivate people to vote when, in fact, they don't have an actual democracy. And the governor had appointed a bankruptcy law firm that was able to erase contracts, take away pensions, sell public assets, all in order to pay the financial companies that Detroit owed money to. So I quit that job and be really threw down organizing uh, around all sorts of issues related to democracy, emergency management. The emergency management crisis is the exact same one that led to the Flint water crisis, which I'm sure most people have heard of. Really, that was the goal of the crisis, was taking away Detroit's water system and regionalizing it and balancing the books on the backs of pensioners and Detroiters. So the Flint water crisis was happening. They began shutting off people's water in earnest. We were literally just turning on people's water. That was a big part of our movement, just turning people on, hooking up houses, house to houses, distributing water. Um, you know, that was my life for until about 2015 when I painted that water tower in a kind of like an act of frustration uh, with the mainstream media narratives around the city. Everybody was talking about the bankruptcy in ways that sought to place the blame on local elected officials as if Detroit elected officials could do something to stop the 50 years of divestment that's happened, as if Detroit elected officials were so corrupt and they were the ones who caused the financial crisis. So I think a lot of people maintain an individualistic narrative and understanding of crises of structural inequality uh, and that's kind of like the ethos of america in so many ways is like we are you could get a room of republicans and democrats together and everybody you could say i'm an individual and everybody's gonna wholeheartedly clap and agree to what you're saying we just don't have a strong enough of a collective consciousness in this country and for me i, I found organizing to be beautiful and, and exhilarating but also kind of toxic at times 
And for me, turning to the land was a way to heal myself, was a way to escape, uh, was a way to actually be able to affect change. You know, when I was an activist as an organizer in college, I was able to, you know, I was able to put a law on the books in Ypsilanti. We were able to make it so that undocumented students could pay in-state tuition at U of M and Eastern Michigan University. We were able to like change rules in the school that allowed art for to be made in different places. And I've had this like history of like making change. And when I got to Detroit, it was incredibly difficult. We weren't able to stop the shutoffs. We weren't able to stop people from getting evicted from their homes. Only some, you know, every now and again, we get some, but it's a lot of losses, you know, and, and it's an important to keep up the fight regardless. But for me, there was a number of plots behind my house that uh, had, I remember watching these homes deteriorate and eventually get torn down and taking that land, which had like, it's like five lots behind my house and turning it into a farm and a place of beauty and connection and a place where we could grow food and, and just get our hands in the soil with my neighbors. To me, that felt like the most amazing positive change I could be a part of, you know, like uh, being able to like see the direct results of your labor is something that's incredibly beautiful. I mean, I grew up landscaping. I started working at 14 doing brick paving work, making patios, walkways, driveways. I love that sort of making things, doing things with my hands, you know, and it's just right. such rewarding work. Uh, and that's really when I turn to the land and turn to nature and turn to the place for healing and collective healing. You know, I, I saw it myself, but I also uh, wanted to bring other people with me. And we began to organize in that way as communities, just getting out to nature. I mean, it sounds like you've had this vivid experience of seeing kind of the worst examples of real, you know, government tyranny, real systematic inequality that's these cumulative forces, both socially and politically, but probably most powerfully economically. And you used all the different avenues that were available to you to make change. And then interestingly, you found nature and working with the land as like part of that solution set. I mean, is that accurate? Is, is developing this relationship with the land and getting people back to working with and having a relationship with nature and the land, is that as important in creating some of this systemic change that we all recognize and want to implement? Is that as important as political activism and adding new laws on the books and trying to fight back economically? Is that, you know, as big a piece of that puzzle? Absolutely. I mean, I'll say this. We have to find joy. You know, mm -hmm. we, we need love to get us forward. You know, it, it, we can't perpetually live in the the grave reality of race in America, of inequality, of, you know, stark, stark segregation. I mean, just dealt like I, I did. So I've done so many workshops in education on Detroit's economic history and it's dark, man. It's so dark. And it's yeah. you've got to like for me, like I, I, I find I have really dark, dark sense of humor. <laughs> like I. I have a deep analysis of the world, but you have to find joy in order to get by. It's easy to close your eyes and like move away and avoid the dark places in this world. But there's so many people who are, who, who are stuck in those places. If you have to live somewhere, that doesn't mean you can't do something to make a difference in that space. One, like bringing nature to your home, planting pollinator gardens, like there's ways to find and bring joy to yourself and your community and your household and your family. And one of those is just getting to nature. You just got to drive through the suburbs to get there. It's risky at times. There's a couple plots in the city uh, where there is an, a couple nice little forests, but you know, everything's about a 45 minute drive. All the best parks, all the best forests that are near Metro Detroit mm. are a good ways away. We don't have any old growth nearby. Oh, there's very little old growth in the southern peninsula of Michigan. Michigan's history is very much so wrapped up in the clear cutting of Michigan forests, really, which happened in commensurate with the uh, elimination of native peoples from this land. But, and I can know those deep histories and also like find so much joy in those tiny stands of old growth that exist in the southern peninsula in Hartwick Pines, near Warren Dunes, in the Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes area. And like you can imagine something different in those spaces. I mean, the, the radical possibilities of seeing a fully mature forest and all the glory that comes with that uh, is so inspiring and, and deeply touching for me in my work in the city. And it gives me the resolve to keep going, to keep pushing, to keep educating, 
uh, and to keep moving. Yeah, I mean, that's that's huge. And we're at the intersection of a lot of big issues that you're dealing with. So it's nice to have one place that kind of gives inspiration, that recharges the batteries, that helps you keep on the conscious charge to, to address and redress some of these massive issues that you've kind of taken it upon yourself to address. And, you know, I think it's really, really, really interesting hearing the story of Detroit because it's a history that I don't think anyone's really that familiar with unless you live there. And maybe that's just speaking for myself. You know, I live out in California. San Francisco Bay Area is definitely a bubble of its own. And so we don't know the extent of the pressures that are being applied to this area, the confluence of economic events that that lead to an area becoming what it is today. And when you're talking about some of these examples of housing crisis and then invoking emergency powers and kind of a classic example of government tyranny, I mean, those are things we don't hear about, we don't think are possible. You know, that's like government tyranny is almost pushed to this realm of conspiracy theory. It's like, no, you've seen it and actually gone through it and been disempowered and your society's been de-democratized. I like to say um, it's really important to dig deeper than government tyranny alone, because I think like with that, uh, a lot of people are at that level of analysis in America, you know, like right. kind of like opens itself to the libertarianism, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. American style libertarianism as opposed to like European style socialist libertarianism. Um, but it's corporate power as well. Right. Miller Canfield this is the law firm that wrote the emergency management bill, you know, that radically reshaped Michigan. Literally, like, there's a black city on the west coast of Michigan, not too far out of Chicago. It's called St. Joseph's. Right next door is a small black community with one big corporation in there called Whirlpool. Whirlpool runs the local government in that city. There was a man named uh, Reverend Pinckney, who was a community organizer who organized a petition drive and ousted the mayor because everybody knew he was a corporate candidate. And through the court systems, Whirlpool was able to get Reverend Pinckney jailed, allegedly for cheating on uh, collecting signatures. Hmm. In that process, when the emergency manager took over that city, because all cities in Michigan, a lot of cities in Michigan where there's a majority black population because of the segregation, which is a whole set of policies and things that intentionally created that, it's both government and corporate everything. Uh, it's both private and it's both individual and systemic, you know, in as much as the ghettos were created by mortgage companies and redlining, which is the government policy, was also created by individual people saying no black people or Jews can live in these houses, can't be sold to these houses. You can literally find that in deeds to houses in Michigan today in the metro wow. area. It's, wow. it's all it's the same all over the United States. So it is it is a confluence of, of corporate power and corporate control of the state. And I think it's important to be specific about that language because government isn't always a tyrannical institution when the people rise up and take power in government and take state control. You know, I, I think there are, there are instances where it's happened and it's few and far between. I think the, there's way more instances of regulatory or corporate capture of government. But I, I think it's important not to cede that ground. Absolutely. Um, and I think what you're talking about is kind of at the heart of what fascism is and that's a word that gets thrown around a lot but really oh, yeah. it's just the one it's corporate and governmental powers becoming yeah. one and the same and combined with nationalism and xenophobia and right-wing yeah absolutely fascism is a right-wing thing the the term is being the right in america is so good at co-opting critique and terms and terminology to the mm -hmm. point that people are calling people fascists for wanting to talk about gender norms or gender pronouns like that's not fascism that's absolutely not fascism um, that's right. somebody trying to assert their humanity that's not somebody trying to deny people rights or cage people or blame immigrants for x y and z problems but i'll say this like detroit's history is actually deeply tied with the history of california i mean the bay area and particularly oakland mm. The United States kind of was at its peak in World War II after uh, Europe had kind of bombed itself out uh, in cities like Detroit provided the industrial goods for the world. Right. Uh, and that's when Oakland was also at its peak and its bay was kind of at its peak. I mean, it's kind of reached a, a, a new resurgence. But I know in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of those communities with uh, export hubs were in a similar right. place. And that's when Detroit was at its peak, around 2 million people. Today, the city's around 700,000. It's been like a interesting time to see like 
you know, when Trump talks about making America great again, he's talking about that time period. And that's really like when the beginnings of the decline of Detroit were kind of being sown in that same period. Yeah. So history is so important. I think it's fundamental. I think as a country, America tends to be rather amnesiac or whatever. Like we have massive amnesia. Right. And I think this is like, also it's part of like the disease of racism. It's part of all of these things. It's like part of, you know, people don't see themselves as part of a longer history like they would if they were had their European identities. You know, I think you're, I think whiteness is like a toxic identity, you know, like you are a European, you have history. If you are an Irish, there's, there's a history of Irish American people uh, who came to this country during the Spanish American war, Irish folks actually left, stopped fighting for the United States and fought for Mexico because they recognized that they were becoming England. In England, wow. colonized Ireland, and they're called the San Patricios. It's like a radical Irish history that a lot of folks don't know. So if if folks are just resigning themselves to white and giving up that Irish history, that German history, you're really losing out on your own ancestry. You know, that's a really that's a really good point, and it's something where we call folks who identify as black African Americans, and we call people Latino Americans, and we call people Mexican Americans, and then or Chinese Americans, but then it's not European American, which is really strange. We should embrace that history. And I think the amnesia you're talking about is really well illustrated in just these recent goings-ons in Detroit that you were just breaking down. I realized that I didn't even know about that. So much less when you go back decades and decades and decades. And it's interesting because I think a lot of the arguments for conservatism, just to maybe overly simplify it, especially in this hyper aware moment that we're at culturally right now, where we're kind of all becoming much more, no one can ignore these issues right now, because it is actually in the news and everything else. The conservative viewpoint seems to be, well, everyone has personal responsibility, history doesn't matter. And then the other viewpoint, kind of the more left viewpoint is history actually really does matter and it puts us where we are today and explains yeah. and, it, and it still affects things. So I think there's a space where like obviously both arguments exist, but I think it cuts the leg out from that extremely conservative argument to say, oh, well, everything's just each individual person's responsibility when you realize like, no, historically the forces at play are really powerful, they're unavoidable, and they're all cumulative. So as more and more of these pressures line up, you know, more and more of these policies that create segregated communities, more and more of these economic policies, the disadvantaged, the the indigenous, the black, the POC communities, those accumulate over time. And yeah. it's something that absolutely has an effect and the effect increases over time. So to dismiss history is something that, that you absolutely can't do. Now, do you think some of those forces we're talking about at play, do you think that might be part of the reason, and maybe this is my own projection, why folks who identify as black, folks who identify as Latino, folks who, are, you know, folks who are traditionally the POC urban culture that make up that landscape, why they don't have a relationship, as strong a relationship with nature and with, with the land is part of that, this segregation, both, you know, economically with redlining and things like that politically is 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 that part of the reason why why that relationship hasn't isn't as strong as it probably should be yeah so i, I want to first take a little little step back I, and i want to jump in this question through this other lens of this history piece that you're talking about um mm. so i think conservatives do have like a, a sense of history and an understanding of history and that's that history that builds a national story you know like we are told history in the united states in a way that builds a national identity and pushes us towards wanting to defend and protect that national identity. Mm. And when you're part of the in group within that community, I think you're more willing to give up your ancestry to right. be a part of that national narrative. And people are violently protecting those statues across the country right now because they're protecting themselves, their sense of selves. You know, there's been a lot of insurgent intersectional ideas that perhaps I think have been unfortunately like. I don't want to say taken too far, but I would say there's an intersectionality reductionism that happens on the left where we equate all POC and all white people as if like there's like a it's like a pure class hierarchy, which is not true. There's a lot of poor white people in my community, you know, that have been subjected to really similar stories, you know, and similar experiences in as much as there are some wealthy African-American people who through the process of integration have benefited themselves. It's so nuanced and complex and there's no like purity 
test that absolves anyone of everything. Like we are all collectively, cumulatively responsible for the stories we tell about ourselves. And that's really what history is, is the stories that we tell about ourselves. As it relates to urban folks' relationship with land and environment, part of its proximity, part of its trauma as well. There's a bit of ancestral trauma with, you know, African-American people, I would say, you know, like you start farming with black kids and various summer programs and someone's going to be quickly say, oh, you're just making us slaves. Like it's very mm. aware in people's consciousness. Trauma leaves through epigenetics, leaves impacts in people's DNA and people will feel it. You know, it, you feel it, you get a sense of it. It's there. It's present in the back of your mind. And then also like you grow up in the city and particularly like I think my generation, 30 and up, like we remember Detroit when it was very like abandoned in, in certain parts. And you associate trees and overgrown spaces with danger and lack of control, lack of authority, like things that become associated with nature. And for me, taking kids outdoors into parks, into forests and kind of breaking down like, you know what, actually humans are the scariest thing in this forest, actually. <laughs> uh, we are the ones who have historically been a threat to the trees, have been a threat to the land and have been a threat to the people who are most closely aligned with nature. And it's a little bit different for Latino people. <clears throat> A lot of us are one or two generations removed from working within agricultural communities, working within migrant communities. So that relationship's a bit closer in proximity. I would say it's the same for a lot of indigenous people with the exception of urban indigenous, which actually there's more indigenous people in Detroit than there is in all of the reservations in the state. Uh, there's a lot of urban wow. indigenous people. It's not a recognized thing, but for urban indigenous people and for urbanized Latinos and African-American people who are, who've been living in the city, yeah, it's, it's proximity. It's also like an association with something that's violent towards you. I mean, I have, I've been pulled over, oh God, probably 50 times in my lifetime by the police or more. That's insane. And I, I live really close to the border of Dearborn, which is historically where uh, a Northern segregationist kind of community uh, lived. Uh, and that border, I've been pulled over so many times. It's interesting. So I went to, when I went to that Catholic high school, that private high school, I, I met a kid whose dad was on the police, the Dearborn police force. So for about like 10 years until he retired, I had a, a get out of jail free card. I had a little bit of privilege <laughs> rub off on me and I was able to get away when I got pulled over, which was so beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that relationship for a lot of communities has been, you know, severed one or two generations back. But I was lucky enough to have my grandma who grew up, uh, she's a hibaro, you know, that's a, a term for hillbilly in Puerto Rico. It's a, a term of pride because that's where the revolution comes comes in the hills the people in the hills are like you know when the when the spanish or when the americans come the people who run to the hills are the ones who revolt and come back and take back power the arwaks and the indigenous peoples who left they left the coastal communities they left the valleys where food production was centered to the hills to hide and to continue civilization in, in their existence so the hibaro term is a, a one of pride for puerto rican people and my grandma growing up she was the oldest of her family, so she had a lot of responsibility. There was deep poverty. As uh, When the United States took over Puerto Rico in 1900, they concentrated the uh, farmlands into uh, sugar plantations. And my grandpa was a sugarcane worker. My grandma was a farmland that ended up being transferred into a banana, mostly a banana plantation as they slowly lost their land. So she grew up real poor. She's thus like a child as a grandma. She's like the funny, goofy, she's like a grown up child, you know, in so many ways. So she would always take us hiking into all of the metro parks around Detroit every summer. Like she'd take us all walking through the forests, catching crayfish in the rivers and just exploring nature. And even her yard, she would keep so many flowers. It's almost like she was like reinventing the beauty of Puerto Rico in her own yard with like perpetual blooms of flowers all year long. And spending time with her was a big, big, big part of my relationship with nature. And then also my family would go camping every summer. Every summer it would be one camping and kayaking trip every summer. And we all cherished that time in nature so much. And I know a lot of people aren't privileged enough to have that relationship or that opportunity. So giving that to young people is a big, big part of my work. And the way it intersects with activism is black and brown people, indigenous people, poor people, 
of all colors are the ones who are the most impacted by environmental pollution, environmental racism. You know, we live close to freeways. We live close to toxic waste dumps. Uh, we live near communities where they spray hog poop everywhere. Right. So you have to like for urban people, it's difficult to mobilize people on environment when so many of your lower level needs aren't being met. You know, there's right. like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know. And when your lower level needs aren't being met, it's hard to like think about some of the higher level needs. Thus, environmentalism often becomes an exercise of privilege. And you have a lot of like people from wealthier communities who don't know much about pollution in the practical lived experience running things. And thus, the policies and the campaigns aren't necessarily driven by the needs of the people who are deeply most impacted. So to resolve this, my thing is like get black and brown folks to fall in love with nature to cherish it, to experience it, to find joy and pleasure and all of the beautiful things in nature so that that you can mobilize them to act on the most important issues of the day. I mean, which I think would be, you know, environmental and inequity issues. And this is that crux of intersectional environmentalism. And, you know, the more you think about it intuitively, obviously you can't have justice for the planet and the environment if not all peoples who are part of that planet, part of that environment are part of that pursuit of justice so and it's kind of like inexorably most connected impacted need to lead i mean the communities who are the most impacted know the problem the, the deepest and they have to be they need the one the capability to lead mm. whether that be like education and like structural thinking and that, that sort of nature i mean whenever we begin to like advance a green new deal or whatever is coming to like engage with this and the united states is the number one oil producer in the world now so whenever we begin to like write this direction that the united states has been on since world war ii with oil we're going to need those frontline communities and their perspectives and opinions and needs to be centered and those are frontline communities in the amazon in ecuador in the the niger delta niger river delta where oil companies american and british oil companies are polluting over there too i mean places where fracking is ruining the water and the soil those communities will need to be centered and we need because their frontline experiences should be determining dictating policies going forward. Now, what are some ways that you see? What are some ways, I guess, that you do bridge that gap and get, you know, poor folks, black and brown folks, indigenous folks into that connection with nature? What are the programs that you do? What are some of the work that you do to actually do that? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about how you see we can put those communities on the front lines and put them in a space where they can lead and empower them like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then we can talk about fungi at some point too. <laughs> we'll we'll get the mushroom. It is mushroom hour. We'll get the mushrooms. It all intersects. It'll be a beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, and mushrooms have played a big part of my own journey too. So I, I look forward to that too. But um, I started doing it just like in my neighborhood. We started planting trees. When I grew up, Detroit was covered in trees. It was a tree city. I mean, unfortunately, mm-hmm. a lot of them were ash trees. There were waves of parasites that have come through and wiped out the trees in the city yeah and i would see people would cut down trees and like the little weedy trees your siberian elms and your mulberries would pop up and those become annoying to people so we started and on my block we started planting trees particularly fruit trees and my goodness this spring when all of the peach trees and the cherry trees were blooming and there's bugs and bees and flowers and now a lot of my neighbors are like, hey, I want to, I want to plant a tree. Let's plant some trees. So oh, that's I mean, incredible. Just, like, I love that. just be an example. I mean, be an example. I mean, same thing with the work I, I shared on Instagram and social media, and other people follow and continue it and want to participate in it and ask about it. So people will seek it out when they see it and when they're exposed to it. I'd say that's like a natural thing that people will do. We mm-hmm. all have an inclination towards nature. And I think mm-hmm. that's one of the biggest issues in, in human consciousness now particularly for urban people, is this disconnection with nature. I mean, I, I even find it, and not to get into religion, but in religion. I mean, Christianity made it by absorbing all these pagan holidays that were connected with the land and connected with nature. I mean, we're celebrating Christmas, but we're also celebrating, you know, the winter solstice. I mean, yeah, there's a, desi- a deep desire within people, urban people in particular, to reconnect with nature in a deep way. So it doesn't take much to expose them, to turn it on, to get that going in people. And the next project with Black to the Land, that was just, a, 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 I was doing the outdoor stuff and taking trips and connecting with folks. And then we all started doing it together. There was a number of, a lot of single mamas in Detroit. 
and we all just said, like, let's let's go on this thing together. Let's go on this thing together. And like we just pool resources. A lot of us are in the urban agriculture community and the African centered community in Detroit or in resistance movements. And it's hard for moms without like a husband or without a, a partner to get out there. But if you're doing it as a big group, you can share resources and share expenses and share vehicles, share cookware. So pooling resources was a big, big part of Black to the Land. And we just started doing it. Like we had no nonprofit status, no nothing. Three years ago, we just started going as a way to heal ourselves and get away from the urban spaces and just bliss out in nature. Yeah. And I think it is something that is like a requirement of being human. You know, all the people I talk to, we all talk about that connection with nature that's so integrated into our DNA, into our programming, that we need that relationship. And what's interesting in following your work is urban environment can be a place where you can have a relationship with nature. You can integrate that into the urban landscape. And maybe it's something as simple as planting fruit trees everywhere. But then, you know, that can also be integrating other pieces of land. And what I'm dancing around and trying to get to is your work with, I believe you got land that did, banks had taken from Detroit residents yeah. and were able so, to turn that into an urban garden. How did that happen? How can we replicate that? So behind my house, there are these five lots that I was talking about earlier that were essentially homes that were taken by the banks and financial institutions. Some of them were actually owned by the banks still when we took them over. But I was working with a, a friend in city government to get to tear down houses. And unfortunately, a lot of the soil in, in Detroit is like fill clay, just like clay. Very, very... Not good in, growing soil. No, not good growing soil. So soil is made of clay silt, sand, and organic material. That's what soil is. Right. So we have the clay, which is rich in minerals. It's all these like tiny minerals and nutrients, but they're biologically unavailable because they're essentially powder, you know? What we did is we, there's a lot of wood chippers across the city. Mm. So we would get them to, uh, or wood people cutting down trees all over the place. These like, you know, protecting the wires and all these things. So we'd just get them to dump wood chips on the lot and this is where i discovered this is where i got into mushrooms just in trying to reclaim the soil and reclaim the land in my neighborhood it was just volunteer days where we get people to clean up there was a car on that lot there was two and a half houses a ton of trash people who had renovated their homes threw the stuff there a lot of times suburban companies will come and dump in the city because they thought like it's nobody cares in the city there's very little like regulation and stuff like that so a lot of illegal dumping cleaned all that stuff up and we have this like crappy soil so we started getting the wood chips dumped there uh, and i'm like well i started reading this book called the soul of soil which is a really wonderful book that talks a lot about like soil health and i was like well how do i get up my soil organic matter you know how do i get that rich hummus going right um, and wood chips or any sort of carbon material tends to tie up a lot of nitrogen as it decomposes right. and nitrogen is necessary for plant growth. So I, I had some little garden out there and it was, they were kind of dinky and not, not moving along as rapidly as I'd like, despite putting compost and things on there. So I was like, what can I do? I began searching online and I found wine cap mushrooms yeah. by uh, ordering one thing of wine cap mushrooms and then I would take cardboard and I would take soil and compost and stuff and i'd mix it into this lasagna straw bed thing and i'd multiply that one package of mycelium to like 10 times its size and then i'd spread it all over the farm all over these wood chips and i get fresh wood chips and put it on there and over the last five years we've built up an incredibly rich soil on that farm and it's just so dark and moist and smells so good and that's very much so like a big shout out a big thank you to the the power of the mycelium. When we think of farming or gardening or orcharding, it's like the mycorrhizal fungi usually get a lot of the credit because they're the ones tying in with the plant roots and they're the ones distributing nutrients. They're the ones acting like that prosthetic root systems on the plants you're trying to grow that can go and get those minerals that aren't in bioavailable form, solubilize them and transport them to the plant. But those saprobic fungi, like the garden giant, also release humic substances into the soil that actually make it a better environment for the mycorrhizal fungi to come in and do their thing. 
So that's really interesting that your relationship with fungi was trying to heal the soil and realizing that fungi are a big part of that. Just to be clear, I mean, this was land that you didn't go get permission per se. I mean, you didn't go speak to the bank, anything like that. You guys just started doing the work on the land. Absolutely. We, I asked them, the most important thing is getting the permission of the local people, of right. the neighbors. Because if you don't have their support, if you don't have their input, if you don't have their ideas and their imagination as part of your space, then you're not going to build something that they feel a part of. Right. And you're likely to uh, annoy people when you let it get a little overgrown from time to time. But if they are a part of it, if their kids helped clear the land, if some of the crops they want to grow are grown there, if they can get tomatoes and things, people feel a part of it. And that's absolutely necessary. But I want to say, like, while I'm healing the soil with fungi, like the fungi is healing the soil and the soil and the fungi are healing me simultaneously because I'm eating the wine cap mushrooms. I'm talking about these mushrooms with kids. I'm like doing workshops with the local youth and people who are interested in fungi in my community. And and people are all just like gathering in this place and it's, and it's healing all of us. Yeah, fungi always seem to have that power to heal the people that work with them. And especially when you're able to eat them entheogenic or not, you like play a role in communing with that fungal consciousness. And that's something that everyone talks about is is how important that connection is. Now, did that also kick you into a place where you got more interested in hunting mushrooms in the wild uh, and then bringing, because I've seen you lead groups out in the wild foraging, you know, for edible plants, also edible mushrooms. Did that kind of get that ball rolling as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say it's also just like exploration online, you know, like social media. Like Mm. I met uh, Ryan Paul Gates with Terrestrial Fungi. Yeah. Uh, he was a big influence on me and in, in helping do that. I also attended um, some permaculture design courses, uh, and I, I attended organic farm school in 2016. And all of these things helped me become more aware. And just reading the soul of soil, all of these things helped me become more aware of the fungal side of things. I picked up some plant books because I wanted to get better plant identification. I was reading about the history of plants uh, and their evolution, and it was only with symbiotic relationships with fungi that plants were able to leave the ocean right um and i think like fungi is very much an ancestor to all of us i came to understand that you know we have more in common with fungi than plants and fungi have more in common with people than they do or in animals than they do with any other kingdom so like learning about that i feel a deep deep connection to them in this like evolutionary ancestral way and also like i'm seeing them kick ass on my farm i'm eating them on my farm and then i'm attending you know permaculture classes where i'm learning about these things and then i just i'm curious to find them in the wild you know as i'm hiking in the forest i'm seeing things i'm wanting to learn how to identify things i'm picking up books i'm following people like yourself and ryan who are like influencing me to learn more and and identify and figure out like how how to classify and yeah all of that like was very much so influential on my own relationship with it and obviously like psilocybin as well you know like experimentation with psilocybin has certainly been an integral part of my own awakening and my own consciousness but between cannabis and psilocybin and yeah all of these things have played a role in uh, my wanting to share this fungal abundance with everybody else <laughs> i'm sure you've gotten the chance to then kind of inoculate young minds with this appreciation of mushrooms and fungi I mean, is that something, do you have now have the kids that go on your trips talking about mushrooms and getting into mushroom foraging and cultivating and all that kind of stuff as well? Because I find that kids especially seem to get really inspired by it. Yeah. I mean, especially like you can show them videos of mushrooms popping up and it's so amazing. Like what you can learn on the digital medias and then when they go into the environment and see it themselves. Now I'll be walking with like some of my friend's kids and they're just like, oh, look at that mushroom over there. Look at that mushroom. I'm like, I'm over here like looking for chickens of the woods and like the bigger <laughs> ones and they're like oh look at that one there look at that one there and they're just like so amazed by it and yeah absolutely like some of the young people in my life some of my nieces nephews my ex's daughter are all way way into it now yeah and i think that's part of that cumulative healing process that as more of us become awakened there's like this generation of people that found paul stamets and found other like minds that got inspired to get into mushrooms and now we're passing it down And it's like this cumulative thing is people become more and more aware of the powers of fungi and how critical it is as part of any ecosystem. It's that third pillar, flora, fauna, fungi. 
you know, it's going to only enhance our ability to work with the environment, protect the environment, heal ourselves, make important change. So that's really inspiring that you're part of that in such a tangible way. And then as part of that healing and you passing this on to the next generation, uh, tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with the Wildlife Federation and working with high schoolers and working with kids a little bit older. What's that been like and what what is that work? Yeah, so I wasn't even looking for the job at the time, but it just kind of found me, you know? I think like when you're in tune with things, like when you're like... When you're on your path, the yeah. opportunities come to you. Exactly, exactly. And this job found me. All the work that I'd been doing Black to the Land and the agriculture, I had found that farming wasn't my path. Mm. I certainly garden and I grow and I, I, I want like this farm by my house. I'd like to like find a farmer to like work it when we get to the infrastructure up. But man, the margins are bad on farming. <laughs> it's tough work, man. Farming is ultimately work. about control, like building capital and land ownership. I mean, that's really the true value of farming is what I learned by taking that organic farming and working on a farm an organic, uh, a CSA organic farm for a year. It's definitely what I took away from that experience. So I came away like, well, I don't know if farming is the route. You know, I, I started like just doing more organizing, continued with the education work. I was getting nice money from universities to speak about economic history and activism in Detroit and indigenous stuff. And the outdoor work led to somebody showing my profile to a coworker and that coworker hit me up like, yo, we have this program. The kind of work you do is exactly what we're looking for. So the program that I'm managing, we got a three-year grant from one individual where we're essentially trying to cultivate an environmental and conservation consciousness within young people by taking them outdoors, connecting them with nature, getting them to understand like environmental racism in these sorts of issues, and then mm -hmm. doing something about it on their campus with a, a sustainability project, whether that be like putting in a pollinator bed, getting bees going, getting a greenhouse going. So every school that we're in, we're doing these sustainability projects and the students and teachers and local communities are leading and organizing it and they're organizing each other and we're just going into nature, you know, together and exploring and foraging. You know, we went up to, I, you know, talked to them about the history of the clear cutting of Michigan forests and the pushing out of indigenous peoples. And then we went up to some of these stands of old growth and they got to like, you know, walk among those tree ancestors who have been here before the United States was. And it's just incredibly powerful for them to get something like a tree and see something that's so far back and but yet so present and so huge, you know? Well, and it seems like such an important part of anyone's education to live on this planet. And I, it just sounds like those are the types of activities and that's the type of facilitation someone could engage in in their community. You know, even if you didn't have the backing of the National Wildlife Federation, I mean, these sounds like things that people could organize in their own communities that probably be of, of huge benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. Check out our, we have a page called Black to the Land Coalition where you can see the, the work with the Black to the Land group. Mm -hmm. uh, also the 313 LEEP is the program that I run with students. And yeah, it's, it's very, you know, easy to do once you build those relationships and get the capital of like, you know, it's like somebody's got to have good car insurance to drive safely through the suburbs. You know, somebody's going right. to ha maybe have like a couple like, you know, identification books or whatever it is. Like for me, like going initially with people who really know what they're doing has always been a really great way to get the courage to do it myself. Yeah, um, and there's so many brilliant people who are willing to share that, particularly um, uh, definitely among the foraging and mushroom communities, except for when it comes to morels. <laughs> but like <laughs> mostly um, guarded secrets for sure. Yeah. But yeah, I think like there's there's so there's so much to tap into and connect with, and it's that human human experience of you know, guided with and guiding other people that's incredibly powerful and you know worth sharing and and being a part of. And, the same thing with like education. I mean, like this era which Bill Gates is pushing for, DeVos is pushing for, where every kid is going to have a computer and learn from their individual homes. I mean, I, I know we're we're all dealing with the realities of COVID and everything like that, but there's something that's so necessary about, in as much as it's important to have a relationship with nature, education requires a relationship with each other for it to happen. Humans don't learn from raw facts we learn out of emotions and 
emotions come from human connections with each other and the lived environment. And yeah, I think being together, feeling together, struggling together, getting exhausted together, exercising together, building together, putting up tents together, all of those deeply human experiences, I think like that collective effervescence is one of the most potent drugs, I think. Like humans, we grew, we evolved in small groups of, you know, 50 to 100 people where we all knew each other and we, we wrapped up all of these emotions together and we, we worked together for our food and our survival and our well-being. And today with the supermarket and the nuclear family and the everybody to his own sort of mentality of we're missing that deeply. Yeah. And nature's a really wonderful place to collectively effervesce. <laughs> I love that phrase. And I think you just laid out a big theme that runs through pretty much all of my work. And I'm going to start adopting that phrase, that potent collective effervescence. And it's just so true is that makes things really embed in your consciousness on such a deeper level when you're doing it with other people, even the knowledge you're gaining. Uh, out foraging when it comes to identification if you do that identification with someone on a hike who knows their stuff and they're telling you and you're feeling it that embeds that knowledge on such a deeper level than you reading it a few times in a book that would yeah be i mean I, put. just your videos alone like your partner with her oohs and ahs really like <laughs> make a huge difference i mean it's the same reason comedy isn't the same when there's not like other laughter involved you know humans yeah. we are social creatures and as much as the government or corporations want us isolated or Bill Gates or whoever wants us isolated to each of our own so we can fill up a house of all of our own individually owned bullshit, consumption bullshit. Right. No amount of stuff will ever make anybody happy. And that's no, all we're seeking. Happy. We're we're all seeking happiness. We're all seeking connection. I mean, that's at the heart of spirituality is connection with nature and other people. So to think that we're going to get in this world where everyone's like isolated and they're all plugged into the network and get fed your information, you process it individually. You staring at a timeline curated by some unknown algorithm, some AI thing, some that's computer program yeah. to make you lonely and play your emotions into getting you to buy stuff and continue to be addicted to that screen. I mean, I love when young people are sick of their own screens like that. That gives me joy. It's interesting because human beings on a long enough time scale, you see how we swing and we over leverage things. So, oh, technology is a good thing and I can be connected to the Internet all the time. That's a good thing. So we over leverage it to the point. I mean, minus the nefarious forces, obviously, that have a stake in trying to make it as addictive as possible and hook you on it. But just human beings always want to leverage the good. And sometimes we go way too far and then we have to like come back. And I think we're just at the start of that period where people have gotten the message, like actually no, our five-year-old should not be addicted to a screen all the time. Yeah. We need to expose people to nature. And my partner always says like the next great wave is going to be, people that are connected to nature, connected to the land, that are bringing others back outside, making them take off their shoes, touch the earth. And that's going to be the next phase of really collective evolution on the planet is people who have already like done that work and gone in like yourself, who've already gone in and done that transformational work, bringing people out and like showing them the way back to nature with and you we got to do it now because the computers are going to be in our brains in the next 20 years. I mean, we are looking at the end of the screen thing within right. the next 20 to 30 years. And humanity's not ready for, for that part yet. I mean, it, it's that is one of the things that I, I totally agree. We have to get it in now, you know, yeah. um, and awaken that consciousness and that love for the environment. And I think that's got to, like, connect with our energy systems. It's It's all got to be integrated. You can't just be an environmentalist. You can't just be an outdoorsman. Everybody's got to be thinking about all of these huge structures right. because that's the only way change will come is if we're all kind of like modulating and vibrating towards collective destiny, which is steering the ship, which is this empire, in a better direction. Absolutely. I, mean, I alluded to this earlier, but the United States is the number one oil producer in the world right now. Like, we are not dependent upon the Middle East oil anymore, which is why you're seeing a withdrawal of troops in Iraq and some of these places after 
30 years of meddling of, on top of the, you know, the colonial borders as they exist there anyways. And fracking is oof, so bad for the earth, man. I mean, like, certainly the technology is growing and becoming a little bit safer than it initially was, but it's not a, a good look for water systems. And man, if there's anything that I think is the most, like one of the most important things for the next gen, it's protecting the water. I mean, that is the new oil, you know, that, that for the future, like protecting and healing the water. So, 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 so vital, so vital. You bring that up and obviously Flint parts of Michigan were the most affected by our most recent cultural awareness of water disparities and just that fundamental element that all of us need. And that's something that is not being provided to people, you know, that vivid illustration of that. And with events like that, and with some of the other histories in Detroit that really illustrate kind of some of the worst aspects of modern society. And I mean, the pseudo colonialist programs and the segregation programs and all these inequities do you think all of those have the potential to turn detroit into a place where change is most possible and i say that because sometimes the systems that get stressed the most or the people that bear the most brunt of unequal systems are the ones who are forced to then change and provide a new way for everyone else do you think that's possible in detroit because i feel like i see hints of that when i talk to people in the area I absolutely do. I do. I do. I think, as we were talking about earlier with the environmental stuff, where like frontline communities, most impacted communities have to like have the radical imaginations to create an alternative. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, look at like places like Cuba, where, you know, they're cut off from communist oil and support in the 1980s after the fall of the wall. There's one of the most food sovereign places, you know, I mean, places where there is like deep, pain there's like creativity and art and brilliance like nobody would believe so I, I do think there's so many beautiful brilliant solutions in detroit but the change is gonna have to come from everyone everywhere i mean in as much as like detroit is a city of seven hundred thousand in a metro area of six million people yeah so yeah. It's, it's just it will never just like while the revolutionary struggles that are born of the african-american community and the latino american and all these like indigenous communities are places where it starts, it's got to ripple out into those suburbs. It's got to ripple out into those places where people have lived the American dream. And that's one of the, the challenging things for people to do because it's human nature to center your own experiences. If you've experienced a decent education, good parents, you know, police who might actually be protecting you and respecting you, when somebody tells you that this little boy who was just most recently killed in Detroit shot at the police in self-defense and everybody's like happy that he was murdered and justifying his death by the police Ugh, it's difficult for for people to see like you it's just natural to center your own experiences and and yeah somehow we've got to break through that space and i think that's really where it lies in the challenge and i've been so so excited and energized by the way that the Black Lives Matter movement kind of started in cities and immediately you started seeing people organizing in suburbs where like a lot of the problem lies as well. Right. Those children of the white flight whose parents left the city are coming back and becoming more aware and going back to their communities and starting to wake other people up. And that's how it's got to ripple out. So I, yes, there's brilliance in Detroit as a result of the oppression and the pain and the marginalization and also the brilliance and the creativity and the struggle and people need to be inspired by it and ripple out and be a part of it plug in and ripple out so we can all like move together in a good direction you know we're all realizing that this hyper commercialized hyper industrialized system loaded with systemic injustices can't last we need to create change but then there's these communities that are comfortable and you don't really want change. I mean, we want to pay lip service and show our conscious awareness that change should happen. 
because there are people being ground underfoot by this like robotic inhuman system. And there are people that are bearing the most brunt of that. And we like need to change that and take the weight off them, take the oppression off them. But when it comes to like rippling that change outward and really having it affect lives in the suburbs in an uncomfortable way, there's a hesitancy because we are comfortable and we don't really want change. There's this great political science professor I was listening to that said when it comes right down to it, a majority of people in society don't want change. They want their situation to be better and the suffering of others to be less in their awareness, but they don't want the actual change that would be required to make a system where the problems that we see aren't happening anymore. And you know where I live in Northern California, Marin County, it's an affluent place. It has very liberal leanings at least uh, in terms of rhetoric. But then a lot of people here don't necessarily want a lot of change because things are good. So if there is any inspiration, and I know this is a huge question that you're not personally responsible for, but you are really smart and I feel like you might have some answers, but how can we help this change ripple out other than through rhetoric is that a huge component as well? But what are some ways that we can help implement this change that we're all seeing right now needs to happen, even in suburban areas, even in areas where the uh, majority of the population identifies as white and is you know, still doing okay in the current system? We're going to have to hit people at their value level. I think that's one big, big thing because people, uh, unfortunately, with social media and the news, there's been like a bifurcation of knowledge and ideas mm-hmm. to the point that it's very easy to have people exist in their own bubbles of political ideology, particularly on like Facebook and these sorts of websites and the news and the news media, which have become extremely partisan these days. So I think like speaking to a conservative people about the money savings of resolving inequality, the ability to stimulate the economy by some sort of like fiscal spending that a lot that, that you know pays good wages to a lot of people who are in socioeconomically depressed circumstances. You got to like find the language that speaks to the values of people. You're not going to like come with like an Oakland radical sort of message and ideology into a conservative wealthy community and find much success. Right. But you do have to like speak people's languages and ideas and values and I think when you can speak that language and communicate deeper truths, I think people tend to be mobilized and, and moved. And I think so you got to combine that like objective data and understanding with very real human stories face to face with those people and things. I think it's a combination of th- those like effective storytelling as well as, um, Somebody in those communities might like you got to connect dots that aren't to them being connected, problematizing some of the things that they've come to see and perceive and maybe think, oh, man, there's something a little there. I don't know. I don't know if I like it, but like there's a seed of doubt in their mind with some right. of these things. And you can you can pull on that string in ways that when they see it again and again, they're like, oh, this thing is actually triggering me to believe this and this. That's exactly what they were talking about. I saw, I'm seeing now the lies that this person, you know, demonstrated to me. Yeah. So I think that's another powerful sort of, sort of mechanism. I mean, there's, there's also just some people who are so like benefiting so much from the system that like, I was driving around in Texas. That's where my ancestry is. Like my dad's uh, indigenous community is based there. You know, I spent some time and, it was a magical trip being down there. Like I just so happened to talk to the right people. I was going down there to do a talk with this Latinx group called Mi Gente. And I just happened to talk to the right person that got me with in with the native community there. And I had intended to look for them, but I hadn't quite found them. And you know how that works. It's just like Providence or whatever. And I had a little bit of time before I was leaving with my cousin driving to uh, whatever forests and natural areas I could find. And I was driving past all of these like little ranches. Texas is chopped up into land parcels and there's a huge swaths of land where it's like fence to fence, where it's like one house on a big property with a big fence line that goes all the way to the street. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, like 
the needs and like values of these people is so fundamentally different. Like they're interested in tax cuts because they are also probably in jobs that don't necessarily afford them the lifestyles that they're leading, which is a big part of American capitalism is like, we're all living outside our means and like through the credit system. That's kind of like what's being pushed. For sure. um, same thing with education. It gets you, load you up with debt so that your imagination is limited by the, by the reality of your own shortcomings, your own lack of funds. It can be insanely um, predatory. Yeah. Insanely predatory. And, and people's behavior is so much worse when you're in a situation of lacking. Right. And poor people don't make decisions because they're poor, they, because they're thinking of their lower level needs. So when you're trying to satisfy those lower level needs, you're not necessarily looking and thinking big term about like that sort of issue. So the needs of those people are so fundamentally different than the needs of people in an urban community. But where they do align is the places to build on in those situations, you know, like right. good jobs. There's so many people who are underemployed or don't like make enough money. Water is another one. Everybody eats, everybody drinks, everybody wants good food for themselves. Right. There's some base level things that I think we can all connect on. And I think there's been a huge boost that's I think going to be a bipartisan thing to relocalize quite a bit. I think people are seeing like the failures of globalization in that there's a concentration of industry and jobs and medicines all being produced in one country, China. So like, I'm not a xenophobic. Right. I don't think like blaming China is, I think it's a big problem in our society, but I think you can play off of like the geopolitical interests of the United States, which is to destroy China to like, Hey, we also should be bringing back industries to the United States. We definitely should be relocalizing our economies. We should be knowing the people who make our food. We should be, building and doing and finding meaningful work that can support us and again like getting to that collective effervescence idea is like doing it together is so brilliant and so beautiful you know i've often heard that a lot of what we in the u.s consider the conservative viewpoint is based around the highest priority being economics and i think part of what you're saying is making that connection for movements for social and environmental justice with the economic argument and I've heard some really good examples of this on um, the environment, like strictly environmental side. You know, there's the ecosystem services argument, which is, hey, if we keep letting everything get destroyed, pollinators are like a $300 billion a year industry that we're going to have to replace. So actually, it's better to help the environment. And always you can infuse these arguments with a little bit of thinking. It does take that effort to yeah. start putting that in an economic framework. But it's the really emotive pop- and the economic, the story and the fact. And it's really powerful and it's really impressive the effect that has on people in diffusing, you know, their immediate, oh, well, I'm not concerned about that. You meet them where their values are. You meet them where they are, right? And also land. And I mean, those people love land. Yeah. They love nature. Like they're so deeply plugged into it. And the conservative party inside really used to be into conservation. There's so much to learn from them too. I mean, ranchers and I watch plenty of conservative YouTube like people who personally do X, Y, and Z land based work, homesteading or whatever, because there's so many skills that like I, I feel like I can acquire from those people. What's interesting is what I'm hearing from you is there's a way to approach this without getting lost in the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's a way to focus on what are uniquely human values to connect with people and push forward the goal of positive change, it does take a little work to like wrangle around all of our weird political obstacle courses that people yeah. build in and their the, head. And the trip words, those trip concepts, like there are concepts that like that I hear in conservative media, when you say it, it triggers all of these other associations. So if you can avoid the triggers for these people, they like to talk about the left being soft and triggered and needing safe spaces. But like there are terms that you'll say, you'll immediately turn somebody off by saying one word. You could be agreeing totally with them on every other thing. But you go into like one topic and they're just like totally turned off because it they remember all of the negative association and narratives that have been built up by media that wants to keep them confined from yeah, caring absolutely. about the land. And that actually gets into my question, which is we're talking about environmental justice. We're talking about back to the land practices. We're talking about inequalities, both economic and social. But does the political avenue where we, especially in this country, we are so polarized and Actually, the differences between political parties 
while they're kind of very different talking points, I mean, the trappings of it look really similar, whether you're Democrat or Republican. Is there a way to leverage political systems to help implement some of these changes? Have you found more success outside of political channels? How do those areas intersect the political and the, these bigger movements for environmental and social justice? Is, is politics even useful? Yeah. I, I think we need an all of the above strategy. We're going to need people who are so far radical that they're pushing different ideas and thoughts into different spaces and they're, you know, absolutist and like all men are trash. Like these sort of like people are, the, are there and they're useful ideologically because we, everything has gone so far since the Reagan era towards like this celebration of American capitalism. It's gone so far in that direction that we need people to pull us in the other directions. So, like there are people who are so outside the system and don't want to work with X, Y, and Z and they're needed. But we also need people who are reformers, who are working within the system, who are connecting and talking to the people in the streets and the people in the middle of the organizers. So it's like, I think there's an all of the above strategy. And I, I don't think like it, it's smart to just like give up on every level, you know, or, or to right. like focus all on like just taking the streets only. That's not a strategy that's going to be successful. There has never been a single revolutionary struggle anywhere in the world that didn't include some of the elite. I like resonate with people who want to be like absolutist about things, but that's just like history right there. So there is like a political issue there, but I think where the politics come together is even working with some of the conspiratorial people things that we were talking about earlier, there's a populism that exists on the left and the right. And Trump came well short of the ideals he espoused. You know, he maintained a couple of them in terms of like pulling us out of some of the areas of war and things like that. But the economic populist rhetoric that he was utilizing before the campaign did not come anywhere near. And this is where Bernie Sanders was able to like capture the populism of both sides. And I think, I think like there is a space, particularly in the economic realm, where there's like a populism on the right and left that I think has a lot of potency and potential. And I think also just like land, I think land, like there's like, it's, there are a lot of single issues that a lot of like, I think people can be connected on around nature and the environment too, around water, around protecting resources. Rich people love state parks too. And Trump has been unleashing like oil and gas companies and selling off rights to these places. And that's a ripe area for organizing and, and waking people up too, because we all cherish those public spaces. Reawakening our public imagination is something that's absolutely necessary, I think, for both sides. And it may speak to the increasing importance in local government where that populism that kind of commons where people have all these very different ideas which is really drawing a permaculture principle which is like outrageous diversity of viewpoints is going to lead to a healthier civic system yeah. but i feel like we hear that voice of these sometimes you know not so different viewpoints as we think they are and some of these ones that are really out there all come together and find this space where they can be heard. And there are these like amalgams of policies that can come together really effectively in local politics. Mm -hmm. And I know in some of your work, you found a lot of success working with this localization idea where you're focusing on local politics and politicians, a community, and that actually implements change in a much bigger way than caring almost about who's elected president, because there's so much that gets lost in the exercising of representative power that way versus something that happens locally. But I, I really see so much of the change we want to implement as tied to economics and to land ownership and work and good work, like good yeah. work. That's a value that a lot of Americans share is like we, we want good work. The nature is a potent place. Work is a potent place. Localizing is a, is a potent place of, of connection. Anti-globalism is a populist place for all of us. I mean, everybody's sick of cheap, disposable Chinese shit. That's really true. We're in this era now where finally we're, we're sick of it. We've had yeah. enough shipping containers full. And just the trash. I mean, we are just, we make so much damn trash as a society. And it's so obscene so unnecessary. Planned obsolescence should not be acceptable. I think there's going to be a rude awakening for that sort of like paradigm. Yeah, again, it's something we've over leveraged. And now we're reaping all the 
the fruits of that over leveraging to the degree where it's not healthy and not sustainable at all. And it sounds like these key concepts you're laying out of focusing on issues or channeling issues through localization, relationship with nature, scaling back globalism, finding meaningful work. Those are ways that we can even address the social inequalities, again, that are so pertinent at this moment, where you talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, you talk about social injustice. I mean, even focusing some of those arguments in these areas seems to be a way that everyone can contribute to actually meaningfully uh, addressing some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in this complex diagram that we've kind of put together in talking about some huge issues, small issues, and kind of integrating everything together, where does the indigenous voice fit into this? And then how has it affected you and your work? A lot of my work has been focused on this Columbus statue the last couple of years. Like, it's been a really good uniting point for a lot of folks. And this is the one you famously taped an axe to his head uh, just yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah, that was definitely my most popular piece of art that I've ever done, street art. Like, I had done a lot of tagging and a lot of buildings, and I tagged fists all over the place. I've done a lot of different street art. People could check out some of it with the hashtag Decolonize Detroit. But um, I think when it comes to, like, society heading in a better direction, the United States needs like truth and reconciliation with who it is and what it's done. I think with our understanding of race, with our understanding of land, like I have been preaching about the history of land in Michigan for the last like three or four years. I've done like dozens of presentations. I've gone to Europe. I've gone to universities. I've talked with students from like Harvard. I've been asked to speak on panels at MIT. There needs to be an awareness of the way that we've dominated land as a society. And that history is fully and totally tied with the colonization, destruction, genocide of indigenous peoples and, and women. Yeah. Elucidating that history, lighting it up, finding ways to see it into the present, I think is a very potent place of rhetoric and propaganda and knowledge and, and awakening. You're not going to understand why Lake Erie becomes a toxic algal bloom where people can't drink the water in Toledo, just downriver of Detroit. If you don't understand that settlers came here and destroyed all the wetlands. Wetlands are magical places. For Anishinaabe people, the people of the Great Lakes, the Ojibwe, the Odawa and the Potawatomi. Wetlands, marshlands are places where the medicines are. It's where certain trees that, that you can build things out of are located. And a lot of those are, are gone and there's an imbalance. And, you know, that's why we have the toxic algal bloom because we've destroyed the environment. And Land that's ongoingly managed by indigenous peoples is the most resilient, some of the most biodiverse. I think we've radically underestimated the complexity and scale of indigenous existence here as a way to assuage our own guilt as a settler society for its destruction. You know, like we've uh, cleared the land of the people who are most adapted to live sustainably there. And they're not gone. They're just relegated to smaller spaces. And their stories, their ethnobotany and their medicines, and there's so much to reconnect with. Western ideology has downplayed the knowledge uh, inherent within those societies for such a long time that herbalists and people are, are reawakening that knowledge within ourselves. The same can be said about like bushcraft people. I think even just critiquing the term wild. Mm. We're going to the wild, you know, like what is the wild? I mean, all of the United States, all of Turtle Island, as they called it, was one large managed landscape. There wasn't wild. The top three quarters of Michigan was all pine trees. It didn't become all pine trees on itself. Native American people used fire to shape the ecology of this area for thousands of years to the point that we had these huge, huge pine forests because the pine trees could withstand the flames. We're just now discovering that this paradigm of Smokey the Bear is actually problematic because you're building up so much wood 
in a place without the seasonal burning, landscapes required indigenous peoples. When the first colonizers came here, they talked about how open the forests were because the native people would be burning the bottom of the forest for hunting, for foraging, for berry production every year. So that would serve their needs as they moved around or as they farmed in different places. Uh, and we're just discovering the benefits of, of seasonal burning. That's something that's happening in an increasing way. They're doing it to fight invasive species. They're doing it to bring back berry production. It's, it's just happening all over Michigan. And we're becoming aware of some of this traditional ecological knowledge that's been lost. And I think, I think that's what permaculture is ultimately is. You know, I, I actually don't really identify with the term permaculture as much, although I, I see the value of it because it's an awakening of like indigenous agroecological sort of ideas. And we're seeing the value of it as we try and find a more sustainable path forward. There's just so much on an individual level in terms of like relationships with plants and forests and space that's like absolutely vital. And it's a shared history among all of the Americas. That's something that unites us. This is, this is all native land. And a lot of times those people are still here and there's lessons in, in their knowledge. So it's almost like Europeans came, wiped them out, destroyed their practices, implemented non-sustainable practices, and now are readopting those practices under this like European banner. And I don't want to project too much and like lose a lot of the subtlety here, but it does seem like mostly folks who identify, you know, as European or white are the ones who are leading like workshops on permaculture and reviving a lot of this knowledge, which maybe isn't in of itself a bad thing, but it just feels like there must be a way to integrate, like you're saying, the communities that still exist with helping to share this knowledge and putting them in positions of empowerment. Is that something where, you know, folks who are promoting this idea can integrate and be inclusive of indigenous communities and put them in a place where they're able to share this information? And is that in some way helping reconcile that kind of shameful history? I think the only way we can reconcile it is by as a country, like, we're, I mean, tearing down the statues is part of this. Tearing yeah. down Columbus statues, because we have to recognize the myths that in our mind and what those myths erase and take away. So I think there, the country has to absolutely have some sort of reparations for African American people and truth and reconciliation for what we've done to indigenous people, like point blank period. Within the public narrative, within our, our, our the stories we tell about ourselves, we erase those stories. And as a society, we're not going to be able to move forward in a good way until we properly acknowledge that history and adopt it into our national narrative. I mean, you're not going to find Germans who are protecting Nazi symbols anywhere in Germany right. because they have properly as a society adopted the story of recognizing the problem of their society. Yet you still have KKK and white supremacists infiltrating military, police, and various levels of government because the police or the uh, FBI weren't killing and cointel proing KKK leaders. They weren't because they were in the government. They were because Hoover himself was ashamed of his African roots. I mean, this is America's history. This is like white identity politics. This gets to that racial conversation we were talking about earlier where white people dehumanize themselves in, in giving up their ancestry. Mm. So all of that's got to be a part of it. And I think absolutely this like there's a need in America for truth and reconciliation. And when that happens, I think we'll be in a much better position to start minimally adopting some of the values of the people of this land. You know, this idea that we're going to think generations and generations ahead when we're making decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we had just adopted that one principle alone, our society would be radically changed fundamentally changed if we were thinking about our babies, 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 babies. Instead of kind of the four-year cycle of, of decision-making that we're kind of stuck in. Short-term corporate profit. I mean, I think I think we're going to have to redo the system. I'm not so one to sit here and believe that, like, we're going to, like, kick out everybody from this country and restart. I mean, even if we did today, like, I think the, we'd be replicating the system that exists here because – so much of the inherent knowledge is, is dispossessed. And I'm not saying it's fully dispossessed and gone, but a lot of it is, you know? Um, right. I mean, to that same effect, like there's such a powerful movement around language revitalization. So much of culture is wrapped up in language, you know? I mean, so mm -hmm. much of like the way we 
philosophize as the world as people who speak English, Western peoples, quote unquote, is wrapped up in English and like we're limited. We're just missing a lot. And there's so much to be learned by protecting those uh, languages. I think there are 6,000 languages in the world. And they said by like 2050, half of them are expected to be gone. So this idea that like indigenous genocide is a thing of the past is not true. It's not true at all. I mean, it's happening right now. What the United States did to the Eastern America is happening now in the Amazon. It's happening right now with our blessing. Bolsonaro and President Trump are on board with Bolsonaro being a cowboy and clear-cutting the Amazon. Well, and you hear stories of that in Ecuador as well, where they're basically forced by the IMF, kind of the new arm of colonialism, to sell off huge amounts of land to pay for predatory institutional debts and are basically ripping up the most biodiverse place in the world and forcing people off land to accommodate mining companies from like Australia and Canada and the U S um, and Bolivia, that lithium. I mean, Evo Morales went down because everybody wants sustainable batteries. A lot of these old colonial dynamics and relationships are perpetuated and rationalized through economic theory. There's one economist I love for people. I always like to recommend. He's a Korean economist named Ha Joon Chang, H A J O O N Chang. He wrote a book, Twenty One Myths About Capitalism. There's this other book called Kicking Away the Ladder, and it looks at the way we don't allow third world countries to grow into first world countries because of the sort of ideology we've adopted with globalization. This idea right. that like, you specialize in tasks and you should continue to do that as opposed to like trying to do infant industry protection and this he's a lot of really good stuff the extractive side of things is like where you really see all of those old things that we think don't exist anymore that are part of like america's old history like how is it relevant to the today it is relevant it never went away and what i'm getting out of this is how important it is to reconcile our past and own our past and it's so funny on a personal level we know this about how people should behave which is to reconcile your past, make right your past, and that's the only way to actually move forward in any kind of productive way. And if we want to kind of create this new landscape of equitable economic opportunity across nations, if we want to really dive into practices that are far more sustainable in terms of cultivating sustainable ecologies and farming systems, and you know, if we want to heal, divide socially, it all starts with owning the past and reconciling the past. And that's, that's really like groundbreaking realization for me because there's so many different viewpoints on reparations. I mean, intuitively we all know that, yeah, that would be the fair thing to do. Like I said, interpersonally, that would be the fair thing to do, but somehow when it's on this grander scale and there's kind of a huge time period put on it, it somehow we think there's like a more nuanced thing and no, that wouldn't fix it necessarily. Like, no, that. People think we can't afford it, but like, look at what we just did through this bailouts. Right. I mean, they just printed trillions of dollars. Printed trillions of dollars and gave it away to companies and oil companies and fracking companies because they can't compete with the low market prices for oil right now. I mean, every single idea, like whether that be like a national railroad system, whether that be upgrading infrastructure, the, the infrastructure in all of our national parks is falling apart. Yeah. They're like billions of dollars behind. I mean... This is where this idea of a Green New Deal could be really potent, both on the left and the right, to protect all of these beautiful spaces that we have in this country and to do it in a more inclusive, better way than the first New Deal was done. People have a hesitancy around this idea of, myself included, I've had my own flirtations with libertarianism and everything, where the government's the one providing this funding to undertake these massive projects. It's like, well, you just pointed out the government's already supplying the funding that keeps everything going anyway. So why not channel that to something that's way more productive or something that redresses some of these problems? You know, I think I myself and different people get lost in this argument that, well, we don't want the government to be in charge of it all because they're corrupt and that leads to a problem. And it's like, but they already are. Without the government, we're left with Walmart. Yeah. What I mean, if, if we cut the government out, what are the next biggest institutions going to take over? It's Coca-Cola, Walmart, Pepsi, all of these mega damn near monopolist corporations that like run everything in the background. If we get rid of government, we're empowering them. 
you could you could argue they're the de facto government already in cooperation with government but if you totally eliminate this concept of representative government then they are the the people in charge you know it's no longer like oh they're mixing at the top and they really control the government it's like well if you get rid of that then then they just are and I, I don't getting money really... out of politics is absolutely fundamentally vital 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 that's what po politics is about the distribution of money that's uh, fundamentally what it's about but we've ceded too much power to private tyranny in this country that needs to be rolled into the idea of libertarianism like we don't have truly free markets never have never have right a book by this name uh, marion mazzucato and the book is called the entrepreneurial state and it talks mm. about how the myth of the individual man who like develops this thing and is an entrepreneur like go for any industry and it has all been government that's created it the transistor the radio the gps touch screen technology everything that is like all the biggest corporations microsoft apple all of these huge tesla they're just working with darpa technology which is the defense yes. army research whatever military has led the way in developing technology and the free market makes it consumable but so much of the innovation in this country has been put forth through the government and all of these major corporations are living off the government teat and preaching left wing like market we get the market on the as the poor people but they get the bailouts as the, as the, as the wealthy people they right. get the welfare as the elites but we get the social welfare state destroyed we get our pensions taken they get taken care of in the financial crisis in the covid crisis you know main street never gets bailed out but wall street is and this is the place the potent place of the left and the right right here is like bank accountability large corporate accountability land relocalizing i mean i think right in this nexus i think there's a possibility for a better society to be born. There's a, another thing within economic history that's really important is we've really relied on the New Deal in that era was the era of Keynesian economic philosophy where right. government spending was actually something that was valued and there's like public good and public things were built. That's the time when all of these wonderful national parks were created and forests were protected. And we've got to reinvigorate that, man, for the fungi. I mean, like we need old growth forests. We right. need more of them. We can be beyond paper. The lumber industry has seen its time. It has been, you've had your run, yo. Like, we'll still use some wood. You can sustainably harvest lumber in some places, but there's got to be a lot more pristine, protected forests. We need to expand that out because, again, as we're all, like, reawakening to the, the importance of nature, it can't continue to let it decline. And it's just interesting to reconcile this huge idea that you know so many people push against looking at government as the only answer but really like you're laying out it's already been behind so many of the machinations and trends in our current society that we might as well use that for good like we might as well direct that to a green new deal where we're going to build tons of parks and keep the ecology safe which again through ecosystem services is providing hundreds of billions of dollars of value per year that we can hardly even measure it's so much it's like so much yeah i mean when you think about water filtration when you think about pollination like we don't even know how we would have replaced those so there's not even really an economic argument against it but then also aiming it at things like in this current moment like reparations and like addressing the huge social shameful behavior that this country engaged in we need to address that yeah. and instead of bailing out airlines instead of bailing we should just be paying that money there and it's so and that's what's so funny to me about this movement that's what kind of my final question i guess because we're really we're getting really deep but in the in the era of the political <laughs> activism and everything you know how do we aim this toward the banks and the governments that really could have the biggest hand in you know, they are the system. They would be the biggest ones to address systematic inequality. Yeah. So I'll say, I'm going to start by saying, like, the case for reparations isn't in slavery. It is in the repeated, ongoing dispossession and theft of indigenous and African intellectual property, land, houses, 
in 18, I think in 1865, after the Civil War, or maybe like 18, during Reconstruction, African American people own more land than they do today. That's that's hard to fathom. People think that like things are perpetually progressing. For the last 15 years, the infant mortality for black women has gotten worse. So when wow. black women are having babies, it's getting worse in our society. Yet people are like, oh, affirmative action is done. We need to end this. We need like equality. Like that's actually equality is like if everybody's like equal and, you know, white genocide and these like little weird, funny terms and ideas that are popping up everywhere. Again, we talked about this, like whiteness shouldn't be a thing. But the period from 2008 to 2018 that I talked about where 250,000 Detroiters lost their homes, literally 50% of black wealth. We're talking about the wealth that African-American people have built up over hundreds of years disappeared and went to the banks and financial institutions. 50% of black wealth. Yeah. Today, the wealth disparity between African-American people and white people, it's gotten worse. Yeah. And since the 2008 financial crisis, the income come gains that will allow African-American people to regain some of that has gone mostly to the 1%. So it hasn't been regained and it has trended negatively. Equality has trended negatively for African-American people. I can go again and again in history, like whether right after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, there was a bunch of stealing of land. In the New Deal period, African-American people weren't offered jobs and the industrial opportunity that made America the place that it was wasn't afforded to white, black, and brown people. In the 19, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, as America began to like develop this American dream in the suburbs, that transferred a ton of wealth. You take a farm and you chop it up into subdivisions that are worth $100,000, and you allow white people only to move into those places and accrue that intergenerational wealth that they can pass to their children, and you move black and brown people into the poor housing stock that they left through the redlining and all of these sort of things. We're talking about the 1970s, the 1960s, where this sort of stuff was still happening. Yeah. And then you talk about the crack era in the way that, I mean, if anybody who doesn't believe this stuff, check out Gary Webb, all of this stuff around the... Um, yeah, look into Gary Webb's story uh, and you'll kind of understand where where a lot of this uh, drug culture that seems to disadvantage urban communities comes from. It absolutely comes from the CIA pumping crack, cocaine so that they could fund counter the anti-leftist revolutionary movements in Latin America, which is what kind of woke me up in many ways. It's like learning about that history. Yeah. So then you look at the 80s and then you look at the neoliberal era that we're in now, which is like the free market fundamentalist champion in the United States. We beat Russia. Now we're number one in the world and the free markets are the best and the American triumphalism of that era of this era has led to the 2008 financial crisis, which is again, continually dispossessed black and brown people. So the case for reparations isn't just built on slavery. It's built on this ongoing American project of dispossessing black and brown people of their land, wealth, labor, happiness, peace, comfort, materials. That's gotta be centered is that truth in that history and that analysis. If we're not centering that analysis, in that understanding in our history and our story of self as Americans, we're going to be going in the wrong direction. And there are a lot of ideas. And I think, I don't think Bernie articulated it well enough when he was running, but a lot of his platform reinvigorating the public spaces in urban communities. I mean, Detroit public schools haven't had band, haven't had music, have have been cut back on art classes, have been cut back on language classes. We need to reinvigorate the civic structures that work in your community mm-hmm. and bring them to the earth. I mean, how, what's, what argument can you make against that? You got your like Jordan Petersons of the world who like, like to ascribe everything to individuals or super popular, your Joe Rogan types, yeah, you know, who yeah. are like kind of like defining white liberalism for the modern American male, white European male. And it's like this individualistic understanding of all these things. And they often focus through a straw man argument about the idea of equality of outcome. Yes. I want equality of opportunity. I want equality of opportunity. I want kids in my community to have athletic clubs, to have functional libraries, local schools. That's not that much to ask. You know, reparations has to include treating the people in the city the same way that people in the suburbs get treated automatically. I mean, people call us entitled in the city, but 
people move to the hood and expect the police to show up on time, and firemen to protect them. And it's like, yeah, we actually know those people don't protect us here. Who's entitled? You're entitled to those things. We're not. We know they're not built for us. This is something that's ongoing now that's had a cumulative effect. And I always point out that like these kind of economic injustices, like you're talking about making someone's biggest asset, their home and their land worth less through a systematic process like redlining and like all the things you laid out, Make, making that making that economic barrier is way harder to overcome even than the social barrier, you know, where someone could change their mind about how they feel on a personal level about someone who looks different than them. Economically, you can't just overcome this issue of, oh, my family has had its most expensive asset that anyone could ever own. The biggest wealth driver has been always worth just a percentage of what it's been worth to another group of people. Then you're always going to be disadvantaged. And some of the things you're outlining, you know, talk about the arts, you talk about sports. Those are absolute necessities that people recognize in a suburban environment or a more privileged environment that those create well-rounded people, those create resilient people, those give opportunities you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. The fact that those have been in a lot of cases purposefully neglected, that's where the reparations are centered in. I love that argument. It's kind of recrystallized my understanding. Free market for the poor. You know, it's like they're saying like, oh yeah, let's do charter schools. Let's get creative. Let's do innovation. Let's like, you know, have innovation zones in the city. But it's like, why don't you do that in the wealthy communities? And do you think there's a strategy to make institutions recognize these realities of the necessity of reparation and addressing these social problems through monetary compensation, not for slavery, but for practices these same institutions implemented like a couple decades ago. Do you think there is an effective channel for that? Is it a blend of like social media, physical activism? Do you have any strategies around that that we could that we could sink our teeth? That'd be a, a combination of your work because like the media is so powerful. Like there yeah. are narratives that have been ingrained into the American consciousness about black men, about black women that are so incredibly strong. They basically like perpetuate the idea that these people don't deserve it because they're lazy, incompetent. They want handouts. So we have to figure out a way to like ideologically in the narrative sphere represent who is truly entitled, who is truly like getting the handouts that comes with that opening that analysis up for people. I think it's, it's possible, but it's going to take a lot of concerted effort and it's going to take very clever thought from those of us on the left. I mean, like, those narratives are still popular within the American consciousness. They always have been, you know, like the oh, people to white women, black male who needs to be held and controlled. It's like, that's still deep when America's like uh, imagination. There are a lot of really important movements around like men connecting with their emotions around people dealing with trauma and the fungi can play a role in all of these things, man. Like I have so many traumatized friends who have been giving lion's mane particularly the ones who have mental health issues because psilocybin is probably a little bit dangerous for them. You know, it's not, if you have a history of like any sort of psychotic episodes, psilocybin is kind of not the place to be, but yeah. everybody could take lion's mane and it has very similar neuroregenerative properties. And I found a lot of my friends who have gone through trauma, who are quitting drugs, who are trying to stop their addiction, who are trying to like make some changes in their attitudes and their lives can benefit from medicines like that. Thank you for brilliantly bringing that back to fungi. And that was going to be my next question is how can mushrooms or fungi play a role? And I think that's amazing is that idea that there are medicinal fungi to help people personally work through the traumas that we're seeing because of some of these social injustices. I I was waiting for like, can we make a cordyceps that can infect politicians and take them over and like pull their head out of their ass? But um, but (laughs) yours sounds very practical. We probably make a cordyceps that'll like turn from entopathogenic to like pathogenic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> explode a mushroom out of their stomachs yeah we got to get terrestrial fungi we got to get ryan on that start breathing <laughs> that cordyceps yeah big shout out ryan he's been a uh, such a good person to me uh and like the son of work that i've been doing in detroit and some of the healing that we've been doing in our community mm-hmm. um, he's definitely like my entry point big time for this and There are places for all of us in like this future, you know, and like a white dude from the suburbs who's really fucking awesome and super aware and super generous. And I think fungi people tend to be, you know, on that vibe. So 
people who tune into the fungal world are inevitably more conscious of these the issues that we're bringing up. Yeah, the more connection, you know? Yeah, yeah. And they're more willing to make that kind of change that's going to support everyone. It's almost like you're taking on a fungal mindset where you're like adapting to achieve homeostasis in the environment. You're like ready to go there. Whereas other people who haven't adopted that consciousness aren't quite, and it's, and it has nothing to do with, it doesn't have to be psychedelic, but it's just like interacting with fungi's organisms seem to activate that in people. And that's what I love about your work is you're working with like tangible solutions, interacting with mushrooms and with other things in a way that change how people think, how people see the world, help them on an emotional and spiritual level. Then you are breaking down and doing the work to really beautifully explicate some of these huge social issues that we're facing. And that's like both sides of the coin that we need to be on is recognizing the problem and then also building up the solution, which is so important because I know a lot of people that rail against the problem so hard until they're like worn out. You know, we need something that can build the new way. If I'm, I'm okay with kind of ripping down what isn't working here, but then we need to also play a big part in building the new way and it'll kind of heal you and keep you, keep you recharged along the way. Yeah. I think a big important concept for folks in this like era of awakening to check out and to tune into is the just transition. We need a just transition away from the oil economy, away from the individual nature of things. And look at the mycorrhizae, you know, look at the way that mushrooms redistribute resources throughout the forest from, from trees, from dying trees, from places where a fire came and they need to like hurry up and have somebody else fill up that sunspot. You know, like we're only just now understanding the complex soil web, soil web economy, if you want to call it that. I don't think like economies are necessarily like e evil things either inherently. Like I think there's like a, a rush to eliminate markets. Markets are sacred. Trade, exchange yeah. goods in peoples is sacred. And we've got to look at that sacredness and look at the fungi and look at nature. And we can really do biomimicry design our society around successful organisms absolutely i think that is a huge part of the way forward and i think that's why so many people say you know mushrooms are going to save the world it's like you can't help but see that i mean it's in their use it's in their ingestion but it's also in mimicking how they behave and even you know you brought up earlier like gender identification mushrooms have like thirty thousand different sexes yeah so it like gives us all these new perspectives. I think it's no coincidence that there's an explosion of cultural consciousness around fungi right now when we most need new models of examining the world and being in the world and new models to mimic. It's like perfect. The fungi arrive with all their different ways of acting in the world that challenge traditional notions of like evolutionary biology and everything else. Right when we need to challenge all those ideas, it's like, ah, perfect. We've got, we've got a new model to work with. Yes. Yeah, a new understanding of the thing that's always right below us, you know. Like I said, thank you for tying that into Mushrooms and Fungi so beautifully. I think anyone listening will agree you need to have a podcast and a show and break down so many of these issues. Like, you really can tell you've gone deep with this information, done so much of the inner work, and you have, like, a real gift of speaking. It's just been a privilege to, to talk with you about all this stuff. Uh, where can people find you? Where can people find more information about you and just tune into your work? I'm trying to like collect my art and stuff and get a website going. But until now, I don't have like the owned media just yet. Uh, but you can check me out on my Instagram, SW Detroit Jesus. And you can follow my work there. You can check out the hashtags that we've discussed throughout this day to check out some of my work. And again, those are um, SW Grows for the agricultural, ecological work, artwork in the community. Decolonize Detroit for some of my art. SWB Detroit for some of the beekeeping stuff. Black to the Land for the coalition work that's happening there. For the work my work with the National Wildlife Federation, you can check out NWFDET. And yeah, yeah, hit me up on the media. I mean, I prefer that over to like getting my email flooded. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, and we'll link up all those hashtags and your profile and everything in the show notes so people can go check you out, check out your work, get inspired, and I think yeah. replicate. Bring me out to your community. I do I do lectures and talks, and I do I facilitate a lot of workshops where people have an opportunity to like 
reflect on these structures and in their own lives. And yeah, I, I do a lot of lectures and talks and facilitation. So I'm always looking for new communities to come and build with. That'd be awesome because I think people I need to, to hear this message. Now, is there any future plans, anything else coming up that you want people to know about, anything to be on the lookout for? Right now, I'm building up my home place, Southwest Grows. I'm investing with the capital that I have for my job and other incomes into this space. So Southwest Grows is something that I want to be building as a community space, as a place where people from out of town can come visit. In maybe one or two years, we'll probably be accepting like woofing and that sort of thing here at this space, which is like a couple houses and lots right in this uh, Southwest Detroit community. Obviously, like continue to stay plugged in to a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff that's happening all over the country. That's super, super prime. And you could just plug right into your own local communities on that work. Take that work to the suburbs in your own communities. You know, there's there's people like me everywhere. You don't need to plug into my work because like this energy that I have and I, and I, it's a part of so many communities. Just find it. There's a, yeah. there's an Antonio in every city. Um, I, ho I hope so, man. There is, I'm telling you, I find them every time I go anywhere. I find these people, <laughs> man. Like they're, we're out here. Oh, that's a, that's a great message. There are three questions I like to ask people, but first of all, I got to know what is a mushroom that you love and why and we can broaden that to say fungi and it doesn't have to be a favorite it can be just of the moment something that's but what's a mushroom you love and why hmm. i'm still like so young in the mycelial world it's like it's tough for me to say like i would just say most recently i've been like helping distribute some hericium americanum to friends on the healing tip mm. so i've just been very happy and pleased with people who have been going, who've been very distressed. One of my friends lost her baby not too long ago. And, um, you know, we had held the sacred ceremony for her and she's been really finding a lot of help and healing from the Hericium Americanum, which is like lion's mane, but it hasn't been studied nearly as much as lion's mane. So there's not nearly as much like data to substantiate its like medical benefits, but it's just, it's got a lot of the same medical benefits. I'll say that one, but there's so many. Oh my gosh. I mean, but that's a great one, Hercium Americanum. Yeah, it, it's the flavor of the moment, yeah, for sure, for me. I mean, I, I don't come across it very much, very seldomly, because there's a lot of really scrubby, crappy forests in southern Michigan. But, uh, yeah, that's the one that, that pops up. And then a big question that I like to get from people, something we might have covered a little bit already, but what has a relationship with kingdom or queendom fungi uh, given to you, given to you, brought to your life? Mm. One of the things about adulthood i think you know, everybody faces you know depending on how old your parents are it's just like the passing of the next generation and i think american society is so poor at handling death and loss yeah and i'm thinking a lot about that because i have a grandma who's going through alzheimer's on my father's side and i have another put the puerto rican grandma who really connected me with nature she's um she's losing her mental faculties a bit she's also like less and less able to walk so it's so hard for her as like an outgoing sort of like crazy fun lady that she is yeah. just like one br super brief story like in puberty she's the kind of like funny old grandma like who were like hey let me see your pubes to make you feel uncomfortable like just to, like yeah. watch you and like mess with you she's like hilarious this hilarious short red-haired puerto rican woman um and last thanksgiving she was like really depressed and like we were all like talking to her and trying to check in on her so she has five kids and i live a house down from her so I like, I'm like uh, locally one of the people who is like a first responder to like what's going on with her, even though I'm a grandchild. She was really depressed and I gave her a microdose. She, I mean, she wanted it. She accepted it. Like I didn't like, pour, like give it to her without her consent. Right. But uh, a little while into it, she's like, you know what? I'm really sad because I, I couldn't cook for Thanksgiving. And it's like it, just even telling the story like touches me because it's just meaningful to her to be able to provide for her family. And she feels less and less like useful, you know? And the idea that like kingdom fungi could give her some peace, like the next day she was like up and taking care of herself and like more like mobile and much happier. And I think the idea that it's been, it's increasingly becoming legalized in different places, the philosophies, I think that's so powerful. And I think that we're just touching on understanding the potential for it, for people in the hood with PTSD, with addiction, 
and all these things. So I'm going to say Kingdom Fungi and, you know, consoling my grandma in her loss of uh, of mobility. I think that was super powerful for me. Yeah, and so much untapped potential in reconciling emotional, mental, spiritual damage that we don't really have the tools to work with. It seems like this avenue, uh, specifically psilocybe and psilocybe containing mushrooms, seem to be this avenue that offers real hope in that direction. And that's a really, really powerful story. Yeah. Uh, and then what is, with all the work you do, both activism, you know, back to the land practices, getting people out in nature, what, well, what's the impact you hope to have with that work? I just want to be a node among many. I just am one node among many that's like helping wake people up. Yeah. I think one of my gifts is taking the micro, the tiny parts of everyday life and connecting them with the macro because every system is so deeply interwoven. And when we can look at like any space and thing and connect it with bigger and deeper systems, I think there's a lot of power in that the micro to the macro, the individual to the collective, the minute to the biggest ideas and consciousness. Yeah, so I think like I, I want to be a node in waking people up in that way. And that's that's it. I just want to help help bring about like positive change. And I, I want my kids to be in a better world. You know, I, I don't like that we're slipping as a people, as a as a society over here, as much as I'd like to, you know, as much as I c consider myself part of the indigenous nations and communities here, you know, my story, my family, my experience, I speak English, you know, like I, it's uniquely American. I'm a Detroiter. I live in Detroit. And I think the other piece here is just like waking people up in this region. I mean, the city needs a lot of healing and, you know, on a local level, I want, I want to be helpful for that in the people's lives I can touch. Well, I think for myself and anyone who's listening, I think you've definitely connected some huge issues together in ways that we hadn't heard before. And stretching the brain and how we think about things so i definitely think you've got a a unique gift for that wow antonio thank you so much for i knew this was going to be like a big conversation like i was trying to get myself ready because i knew how smart you are and how how varied your knowledge is in some different arenas and i'm definitely blown away so thank you for coming on the show being really open talking about all these concepts keep doing the awesome work you're doing Totally. My DMs are open. I would love to connect with anybody's, you know, interested in and impacted by these ideas uh, and much love. 